we have the great fortune of having Professor Richard Epstein uh, provide comments to uh, the panelists. And um, although uh, everyone here is familiar with Professor Epstein, I just wanted to say a couple of things um, about him uh, as aside from his title, which of course is the James Parker Hall Distinguished Service Professor of Law at the University of Chicago. Um, we are familiar with his long list of distinguished and influential scholarship. Um, as an example of that today, this morning, there was a panel that was entitled Richard Epstein's Legacy in Torts, um, where everybody got to uh, talk about what they perceived his legacy to be, and that's um, delightful given that he's still with us, so we can be talking about his legacy <laughs> on torts that <laughs> happen to be continuing. <laughs> yes, uh, and just as a personal anecdote, this year teaching torts for the first time as opposed to criminal law, um, your scholarship has been incredibly useful and helpful, and my students are complete converts at this point. So uh, with no further ado, um, I thought we'd start by just having you give your commentary, and then at the end we'll let them uh, take less than two minutes each to respond. So, I so I was thinking. Respond. Do we should so, respond? Uh, mm, yeah, no. So, 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 so le I was thinking that uh, 15 to 20 minutes, depending uh, on. I, I would like to hear what he has to say. I do want to do it. First of all, I would like to commend all the speakers for what I thought were really extremely spiffy presentations. Um, I think everybody in the audience should be aware of the fact that there was a marvel of a precision and exaction and also a very high and highly favorable ratio of ideas to words, which is not always the case <laughs> um, when we hear presentations of this sort. Um, if brevity is the soul of wit, this was a very witty presentation, <laughs> so, indeed. Um, now, th to try to talk about these, I mean, it is, I think, a blessing that we have the order that we've done, because we have two technical papers, two con law papers, and one philosophical paper. And as befits the occasion, I will sort of ask questions and sort of raise queries, express modest disagreements, but offer no praise beyond that which I have already <laughs> extended, because I don't think it's particularly productive. And the first paper is by Ted Frank, who is one of my former students students, if I'm not mistaken, right? Oh, yes, sir. Oh, yes, sir. And Marie, whom I worked with at the Manhattan Institute, so I regard this as part of the old home association. And I, and, you know, I think, in effect, it is an extremely elegant paper, uh, particularly with the results. And the question is, what does it tell you about how it is you ought to frame the law on the one hand and how it is that you ought to frame your insurance policies on the other? One of the things about this model, which I think was really quite striking, is that it did not ask the question of how it is that you decide what the limits are that you're going to impose on one of these policies before you start to play the games in question. Um, what happens is it turns out that it's a very complicated kind of question, uh, particularly since you've got this bad faith action uh, which a disappointed plaintiff can give against an insurance company uh, even when it seems to behave in the quote right fashion, a method I'll define later. And, and the problem is if you set this limit extremely low, what happens is the insurance company always has itself a very nifty out in what it can do is simply offer the limits of the policy flat out, escape the potential liability under the Stour case, whatever the hell it's called, um, and go home. The difficulty with that is at that point, if the numbers are this low, it may well be that there will be a large number of people who say, well, it's a $100,000 policy, I have a $300,000 claim, uh, this is a doctor, you can now bring a suit against the doctor for the $200,000, and so setting the limits that low means that you lend yourself very vulnerable to the kinds of claims which are big enough to matter, and most people don't want to buy policies that are going to be at that particular mm -hmm. level. So setting low is not necessarily an ideal strategy. And then, of course, you could run it into the opposite direction, which says that the way in which you avoid excess policy problems is you simply give a no-limits policy, and you know that will solve all the problems with respect to bad faith actions because there's no tail that will be brought to bear against the other person. But that isn't so terrific either, uh, because at this particular point, it's not clear that when you start talking about these cases uh, that the policy is going to be affordable given the fact that there will be some long tail with an opposing risk. And so trying to figure out where in the middle you paste these policy limits is, I think, an interesting question. And I would like to see, as you go by the income of doctors on the one hand or by way of specialty on the other, exactly which way you would want to go on this and what. Second thing I'd want to comment about this paper is I think what they really ought to do is to respond to the way in which these Stowick claims are computed and, and give some sort of a critique of it. Uh, what's the proper definition of a bad faith action in these particular cases? There is, in fact, a precise mathematical definition which is systematically disregarded in the Texas material, which is as follows. 
When you settle the case, what you're supposed to do is to look at the amount of the claim and to settle it for the same amount of money as if there were no limits policy that were involved in this particular case. In other words, you're not allowed to prefer yourself to anybody else. So if you looked at those Monte Carlo simulations and you see that an expected case is going to be, you know, a 30% chance of a $500,000 verdict or whatever it is, $150,000 turns out to be your number, uh, anybody who basically figures out what that's the valuation of and sets within policy limits consistent with that is fine, but if it turns out they're asking the policy limit, as they often do, it is not bad faith to refuse the settlement under these circumstances. And what happens is you cannot, as the Stauer model works, treat the ex post result in a high sort of variant situation as being an accurate remedy as to whether the uh, original decision was in good or bad faith. And so I think what one would try to do as a normative matter is to take their presentation and see if you could actually persuade the Texas court to revisit their work in order to give a more precise definition of the way in which this thing should go. Um, I do think that what I like about the paper and what I've suggested I think holds true in this case is that we now have both positive agendas for further research and you've got a normative account of what it is that you might want to do with it and one of the tests of a good paper is whether or not it seems to suggest a second or a third good papers uh, that might be brought forward and I think on that ground they're fine. Fifteen minutes she says. I've got, I'm, I'm trying to do five minutes of paper, right? Okay, okay. Now, but to Miriam Baer, I mean, she's the only person whom I've met here and I'm very proud to have made her acquaintance but because I thought again this was really a very suggestive paper in terms of the kinds of things that's involved. But let me sort of indicate how I would approach the subject, which I think at least in part differs from the way in which she did it. Um, hers is a theoretical explanation which asks the question as to whether or not you're going to get optimal deterrence given the fact that every time you make a sweetheart deal with somebody, you're reducing the amount of deterrence that you get against one individual in order to increase the amount of deterrence that you get against another. And so at least at the abstract level, what happens is you've got two forces moving in the opposite direction. Then I think she's dead right to add on that not only do you have this particular problem, but also if you have the situation of manufactured testimony whereby somebody will induce fraud, you know, knows that they're guilty and tries to finger somebody else who isn't in order to get themselves out, uh, that might deter the, mess up the deterrence system even further by virtue of the fact that you're going to start to get some false positives in there. So the question is, how do we put all of these three factors together when we're trying to evaluate the situation? Well, the first thing I think one has to do is to ask something about the incentives of the prosecutor when you're faced with these three conflicting forces to see the way in which they're going to start to interact one to another. And, and what is the kind of situation you have? Well, first of all, it's very difficult to figure out what a, a prosecutor's objective function is going to be. And at least as I read the paper, you didn't actually specify that in the model. And one of the things that we're always worried about is the agency cost problem as to whether or not a prosecutor will have some particular private motive which deviates from that of the system at large. And I don't think that that's actually the dominant problem in this particular case. Um, I think there may be such issues uh, investing too much time in one case relative to another case by way of selection and so forth. But for the most part, I, I think that I would regard the prosecutor here as probably an honest broker or representative of the office of which he or she happens to serve. Well, if that's the case, then the empirics, I think, become pretty clear. Uh, we actually look in practice and we see a very extensive use of these kinds of agreements. And what this starts to suggest is that on balance, uh, the positives that you get are going to dominate the negatives. And then the question is, if that's the observed behavior, can we come up with a theory which explains why it is that this particular estimate is in fact likely to be correct? And I think if you start looking at the three elements in these particular cases, you can find out why the observed equilibrium is in fact probably a sign that we're pretty much at the social optimum, or if we're not, that small tweaking rather than large changes are going to be the appropriate method. And the first point I think that one notes, and here I'll just simply take the antitrust laws as an example, is that if you start looking at treble damage actions, the usual immunity game that is, or the, the dispensation game 
that is given to various people quite simply runs as follows. This is a treble damage universe. Uh, you are the first to rat on your co-conspirators with respect to the cartel and fox fixing arrangement. It's not that you get off scot-free, it's that you get off without the treble damage component with respect to the liabilities in question, or there's some other reduction. And so by virtue of the fact that nobody gets a free pass on this kind of a situation, uh, it turns out that the amount of detriment that you have to pay is not going to be very, very large. It's just going to be respectable and substantial. And if it's, of course, trivial, nobody will ever come forward for it. So my sense is that picking that sort of sweet spot in the middle is more or less what they've done.